Bon, donc on va recommencer le travail de cet après-midi. On a en effet trois communications et on va commencer avec la communication de M. Emmanuel Boutigig de l'Université de Malte. Euh, il est euh, donc euh, senior lecturer euh, en histoire moderne à l'Université de Malte. Il a fait ses études tout d'abord en Malte, puis euh, à l'Université de Cambridge en Angleterre. Il a, a publié notamment un livre euh, qui sont, euh, a pour titre « Nobility, Faith and Masculinity, The Hospital Knights of Malta euh, » 1580. Et, à, à 1700. et il a aussi publié euh, un livre coédité avec son collègue Simon Phillips, uh, « Islands and Military Orders », qui tombe très à propos pour nous. Et donc, euh, son sujet d'aujourd'hui, c'est uh, « The Island Order State on Malta, the Early Modern Maltese Archipelago and the Order of St. John uh, ». La parole est à vous. Merci. <coughs> Bonjour. Um, I would like to start by thanking Professor Sanjay Subramaniam for the kind invitation to contribute to this symposium and to the staff of the Collège de France for their logistical support. I feel very privileged to be here today. I shall commence my presentation with a story. On the 25th of June 1605, the French Hospitaller, or Knight of Malta, Fra Petro Keiran appeared in front of the Roman Inquisitor of Malta and told the following story. Some two months ago, I was discoursing with a servant at arms of the Langue of Provence called Monsieur de Barducci. He told me that one day he went hunting in the company of a Spanish knight called Fra Antonio Moretto Giron of the Langue of Castille. The said Giron told Barducci I will show you something terrifying, but you need to avoid making the sign of the cross, and you should not be afraid. Barducci replied that he would not be afraid, even if he were to behold all the devils. Giron then told Barducci to turn his face around and look towards the sea. Having done so, Barducci saw a whole troop of armored horses and black men riding horses, and these surrounded them. Barducci saw one of these black men with his sword unsheathed, moving towards him, getting ready to strike him. Frightened by what he saw, the said Barducci pronounced the name of Jesus, and all the men and armored horses immediately dissolved. It was natural for those living on Malta in the early 17th century to perceive the sea as a source of danger. The Christian-Muslim confrontation was interwoven with their daily life. The hospitalers, true to their warrior identity, projected their fears in military terms. The armored horses and black men were a representation of the all-too-real onslaught by Muslim forces on Christian shores and shipping. And of course, the onslaught worked on both directions. And here is a reminder of one type of admittedly unwelcome connectivity, which ensured that early modern Malta's isolation could only ever be a relative one. The core of my presentation explores levels of interaction between two historical phenomena, islands and military religious orders. Islands are often, by definition, seen to be embodiments of insularity, of an effort to be separate, distinct, cut off. Military religious orders are, conversely, international in scope, nature, and personnel. And therein lies the crux of the matter. How did insular outposts and international institutions come together to forge distinct and often, but not always, successful experiments? In trying to answer this question, I hope to be able to offer an insight that will also be relevant to our wider discussion on islands here today. I will begin with some background about the coming together of the Order of St. John and Malta. Then I will move on to the core team, which consists of a focus on the notion of the island order state. 
This will include an analysis of aspects such as quasi-islands, or as Fernand Brodel said, islands that the sea does not surround. The mainland-island relationship, and islands as potential laboratories for ideas to be tested. Finally, I will look at the importance of the notion of island ports, emphasizing the harbor dimension of the island order state, which was arguably its most important characteristic. When the military religious order of St. John established itself on Malta, it set in process a relentless process of transformation across the islands, but in particular around the area that was washed by the waters of what they called the Porto Generale, and today we call Grand Harbor. There was a very intensive nexus, both physical and virtual, between the cities of the harbor that was sustained by the daily crossing of several boats along its littoral, with the sea acting as a highway of communication. In turn, this, what we could call a landlocked sea, was not a self-contained world, but one which constantly interacted with both its hinterland and all the shores of the Mediterranean. The complex of bodies of water and stretches of land that constituted the early modern harbor of Malta was intended to be approached not so much from the land, as tends to be the case today for most visitors to Valletta, but from the sea, as attested in the 1770s by the French artist Jean Huel. He said, the entrance to the harbor of Malta resembles a wide road. The port is formed on both sides by high rocks which rise vertically. Various tiers of batteries for cannon have been cut into these rocks. The batteries are situated at different levels, making it impossible for anyone to enter the harbor without the permission of the guards of these batteries. Who else simile, comparing the entrance to the harbor to a road, blurs the line between land and sea. Here one had the liminal space for entries and departures. His impression of the harbor as a conglomerate of rock and cannon emphasized Malta's role as an island fortress on the Christian Muslim frontier. At this porous yet keenly guarded water gate, the order organized celebrations, saluted distinguished guests, punished and condemned individuals by public hanging or by exposing their severed heads. It was also at this point that some form of light beacon existed that was intended to guide seafarers to the safety of the harbor. Yet a beacon announced the island to friend and foe alike, creating a tension of its own. Those welcomed to traverse this wide road could expect to encounter a pleasant environment. In Howell's words, the way of life of this place contributes substantially to making foreigners of all countries easily feel at home." End of quote. Nevertheless, since what we see depends on where we stand, reactions to Malta and its harbor varied. This, for instance, was the ambivalent reaction to Malta of the German Baron Johann Hermann von Riedesel, who visited Malta in the late 1760s, just before Huel. He said, I was struck by the aspect, the grandeur, and the multiplicity of so many bastions, revelants, and batteries. But soon after, I could not refrain from pitying the situation of those who, already restricted by nature and by the sea that surrounds them, have only as their home a very small stretch of land and who are ever more restrained by skill in an even smaller space of the same rock. So while full of admiration for what the hand of humanity, working upon the canvas of nature, had created in the harbor of Malta, von Riedessel also felt himself locked up, caged in. The three words that sum it up are pity, restriction, and restraint. Islands are not just geographical expressions, they are loaded with cultural associations and assumptions. 
What von Riedesel highlighted was the fact that the geography of Malta is a combination of insulation and smallness. This was not just a land surrounded by sea, but a small land, a rock, surrounded, restricted, in his words, by sea. Size does matter. Significantly, when we look inside an 18th century dictionary of the Maltese language, drawn up by Gianfrancesco Gius da Soldanis, a Maltese priest who was a contemporary of Huel and von Riedesel, his definition of an island reads, Xira, isola, scoglio dal mare circondato, that is Xira, island in Maltese, is translated as isola, island in Italian, which means a rock surrounded by the sea. Now, De Soldan is hailed from Gozo, which is Malta's even smaller sister island. That the term island should, in his dictionary, equate to a rock seems only natural. Indeed, the rock continues to be a widely used expression even today by many Maltese when referring to our island. So when discussing the geography of the Maltese islands, one has to factor in not just insulation, but also smallness. In, their, in turn, their history has been shaped by both isolation and connectivity. At this point, allow me to say a little something about my two protagonists, the Order of St. John of Jerusalem and the islands of Malta. The members of the order are called Hospitalers, a title derived precisely from their foundation as a hospice in 11th century Jerusalem. Alongside the Templars and Teutonics, the Hospitalers constituted one of the three great military religious orders of the Middle Ages. And significantly, they were the only one to survive into the early modern period. Gradually it expanded. From a nursing institution, it grew into a military and naval one with the aim of fighting Islam and defending Christendom. As a result of the struggle with the forces of Islam, the order had to move its headquarters a number of times. And that's why in 1530, they land on Malta. It's been estimated that in 1631, there were about 2,058 hospitalers scattered across Europe, almost half of whom were French. Young and old noblemen from diverse backgrounds filled the ranks of the Order of St. John. So in brief, this was the institution, and these were the men who from 1530 to 1798 ran Malta. I now turn to Malta, or rather the Maltese Islands, which lie some 96 kilometers south of Sicily and 290 kilometers from North Africa. In 1530, when the knights get there, the islands were inhabited by a Latin Christian community who spoke an Arabic sounding tongue, that's Maltese, and Italian as the language of contact to the outside world. During the period that the hospitalers controlled these islands, Malta was a theocracy, a state ruled by religious men. The Grand Master of the Hospitallers, the Bishop of Malta, and the Inquisitor all responded to the Pope. Three socioeconomic factors dominated the spirit of Maltese history, the incessant urbanization, migration, and the growth of the population from about 20,000, when the order gets there in 1530, to about 100,000 by 1798, when Napoleon arrives. These then are the two protagonists of this presentation. On the one hand, a small, island in the middle of the Mediterranean, and I have to keep emphasizing that here, alongside insulation, one has to take into account smallness, and on the other, a rich, dynamic, international, military, religious institution. Now, how are islands taught of? And we had some reflections about this already this morning. There's obviously a very rich tradition of writing about islands. Benedetto Bordone's book, Isolario, the Book of Islands, was in fact an example of a quite popular genre in the 15th and 16th centuries that focused on islands. Such books resembled atlases and their images, but generally contained more information. 
In a sense, such books contribute to discourses about island isolation and accessibility, for their pages glean these scattered places. There is also a rich tradition of using islands as metaphors for a particular discourse. Thomas More's Commonwealth was located on the island of Utopia. William Shakespeare's turbulent play The Tempest unfolds on an island. Francis Bacon placed his own ideal society on the island of Ben Salem, while John Donne's No Man is an Island must be one of the most used expressions ever. In his book Islands of History, the anthropologist Marshall Sahlins focused on three islands in the South Pacific, Hawaii, Fiji, and New Zealand, to analyze how their histories intersected with European history and with what results. Sahlins emphasized how the people of the South Pacific, despite the established view among anthropologists, did possess a history of their own. An important insight that Sahlins provides is that isolation is hardly ever as absolute as it's made out to be. So let's take, for instance, the case of early modern Gozo, the island of an island, so often quickly relegated to a state of unchanging isolation. In 1654, the hospitaller governor of Gozo was investigated by the Inquisition. His name was Fra Giorgio Beringo, and he was possibly Polish. We have a description of this governor of Gozo sitting in his hall, surrounded by his own courts, with clerics, doctors, notaries, and so on. Now, the problem was that the governor was accused of being a Lutheran and of eating meat on prohibited days. This case study of Beringo shows how even this island, Gozo, often seen as embodying the essence of isolation, was, through the hospitalers, connected to wider structures and currents of thought. This is an instance of how a variety of forms of interaction between external factors and indigenous elements could in fact take place and were determining and shaping human experience. Through these, we can both observe the wider picture and delve into patterns of life and disruption to them, to these. So when writing the history of Malta, Gozo, and their people, and that includes the hospitalers, one ought to stand intellectually on its shores and look out to see as much as towards the land. Now, these points that I'm talking about um, reflect the conference that I organized some years ago with my colleague Simon Phillips of the University of Cyprus. Military religious orders, which is what I usually study, uh, are often studied in isolation. So in this conference, we really wanted to start bridging um, the military orders, but in relation to islands. In broad terms, and we hadn't planned this, the conference and the subsequent publication fell very naturally under two categories, history of islands and history on islands. By history of islands, the focus is on islands as categories of analysis to be problematized and brought to bear on the study of the military religious orders. By history on islands, the emphasis moves more towards the coming together of islands and military religious orders and how this fashioned human activity. Insights gained from working on that project have stayed with me. Both history of islands and history on islands intrigue me, and I find that they overlap and interact most intimately in the notion of the island order state. Now, the term order state is the English rendering of the commonly accepted German term Ordenstadt. The original Ordenstadt was created in Prussia, in Northeast Europe, from the late 13th century by the Teutonic Order, which controlled an extensive continental territory and several hundred thousand subjects. In the long run, however, it was too successful for its own good, for once its pagan neighbors had been converted to Christianity, the moral justification for its existence was gone. And by the 16th century, the Teutonic Order state was replaced 
in successive stages by other political entities. The term order state has lent itself to become island order state when talking about the Order of St. John on the island of Rhodes from 1306-09 to 1522. A key feature of the island order state was the way its ruling cast of knights all came from outside Rhodes. On the other hand, the island order state shared many similarities with other polities in that it had to deal with the issues that any state has to face. Religious affairs, urban development, defense, the economy. Yet in all these spheres, the hospitaler island order state on Rhodes often had to be innovative as it dealt with its own particular challenges, not least the constant factor of being on the frontier with the Muslim enemy. Island order state is a term of recent coinage which has been used for Rhodes, but not really for Malta, which is what I'm trying to do. I admit that while I find it represents a historiographical category of analysis that holds a lot of potential for thinking creatively about how the order functioned when it was based on an island, it is still a work in progress that requires much more fine tuning. Now, Hospitaller Rhodes and Malta turned out to be the most successful cases of order states, in large part, it would seem, because they were island order states. There were attempts to establish military religious orders on other islands, and there were factors beyond being an island which determined whether such partnerships would work. Factors such as the size of the island, its location, the financial position of the order in question, and the wider Euro-Mediterranean geopolitical framework. For instance, between 1191 and 1192, the Templars were rulers of Cyprus, but that proved far too large to govern as an order state. Between 1300 and 1302, the same Templars made a little acknowledged attempt at forging some kind of island order state on the small island of Ruad of Tortosa on the Syrian coast, the Red Circle. But that turned out to be too small to be defensible. Over 100 years later, Pope Pius II, looking, it would appear, at the example of Hospitaler Rhodes, which by then was well established, created the military religious order of St. Mary of Bethlehem to be based on the island of Lemnos, up there in the Red Circle, um, in the Aegean Sea. It was to be an island order state poised to fight the Ottoman Turks. In the end, nothing came of this, not least because the Ottomans conquered Lemnos in 1459, but also because of financial and logistical difficulties. Nonetheless, the examples of Ruad and Lemnos highlight the significance of islands and the mentality of Latin Christendom as outposts that could, under the management of a military religious order, both defend Christianity and take the fighting to the other side. Another two examples that further illustrate the limitations of an island order state project are worth mentioning here, although they both require some qualification. First, at the beginning of the 15th century, the Portuguese crown granted patronage of the archipelago of Madeira in the Atlantic to the military religious order of Christ. Constituted in 1319 out of former Templar assets in Portugal, the Order of Christ had as its master the King of Portugal and was increasingly an extension of the Crown of Portugal rather than an autonomous institution like the Order of St. John. Patronage of Madeira meant that the Order of Christ could nominate the ecclesiastical staff in the churches of Madeira and the island of Porto Santo and that the master, was the king, would receive an ecclesiastical tax. Far from constituting an island order state, as was the case with Rhodes and Malta, in Madeira the relationship between the Order of Christ and the island was of a limited nature. In contrast to the increased security of Rhodes and Malta under the Hospitallers, Madeira did not benefit in any such way from its contact with the Order of Christ. The political establishment in Portugal did not, it seems, 
see any advantage in having a more autonomous Madeira, while the Order of Christ did not have the same inherent strength and resources that the Order of St. John had. This can possibly be a case of an island order state monke. The second example, also from the Atlantic world, relates to a brief episode between 1653 and 1665, when the Order of St. John ruled the Caribbean possessions of St. Christopher, St. Croix, St. Bartholomew, and St. Martin. These were bought from France and were naturally never intended to become a separate island order state. Instead, they represented an attempt by the island order state on Malta to stake a colonial claim in the New World. Like other such Caribbean possessions, sugar was one of the most lucrative crops that could be grown here. And indeed, it was not the first time in the order's history that it had managed sugar production. Both on Cyprus and Rhodes, the order had profitably cultivated sugar for many years. It of course took time and effort for the order to start reaping a financial benefit from these Caribbean islands. But in the end, in 1665, the order sold these islands back to France. It was a short-lived but interesting experiment which failed not because the order was not able to administer these islands, but because of the pressure which France, in particular Jean-Baptiste Colbert, was able to exert on the order. The Hospitaller Maltese Island Order State never operated in isolation, and international affairs, in this case the powerful leverage that France held over the order, invariably swayed the decision-making process of this political entity. Let us now focus on some aspects of life on the island order state of Malta, which by some accounts was very interesting. Fabio Chigi, who was Inquisitor of Malta and later Pope Alexander VI, summed up the way of life of the knights on Malta in the early 17th century as follows. An island inhabited by bachelors and youths from all nations of the world who know no guy nor fear and the old ones are not saints either. Nearly 100 years later, the young Comte de Cailou summed up the way of life of the hospitalers in Malta as follows. Life was far from austere, and Malta might have been nicknamed Gomorra Parva. He was, enthusiastically I should add, describing little Malta as little Gomorra, recalling the biblical city which was destroyed by God for his behavioral and sexual excesses. Over the years, Malta gained a reputation as something of a debauched island brimming with prostitutes. This was largely due to the often exaggerated accounts of travelers. Prostitution was certainly an element in the mosaic of life on early modern Malta, but it was more complex as a social phenomenon than such generic impressions. Indeed, early modern Malta was a much more complex reality. The term Hospitaller Maltese Island Order State is used here to reflect the fact that the order was based on Malta and this had an impact on its shape and workings. It also emphasizes the fact that the coming of the order to Malta did not exclude the Maltese from participating in the running of their island, as traditional, often nationalist accounts have tended to emphasize. But instead, the order could only operate on Malta because it co-opted elements of the Maltese into its governance. In terms of commerce and food supply, the accent in Maltese agriculture was on the production of cotton as a cash crop, a factor already evident in the 16th century and which reached a high level of sophistication in the 18th. With regards to visitors and pilgrims as a source of income, while Malta may not have equaled roads with regards to pilgrims, since Rhodes was an important and natural stepping stone for Christian pilgrims going to the Holy Land, Malta did have its own cult of St. Paul. The order brought this under its tutelage and it became an other element that drew visitors and therefore income to the island. In terms of the island's maritime sector, corsairing was very important and I shall come back to that in a moment. As stated above, 
an island order state was in many ways similar to any other uh, medieval and early modern polity dealing with the day-to-day -day administrative issues that any state faces. Nevertheless, one peculiarity of the island order state was its dependence on outside economic resources in the form of lands that the order owned across Europe. These lands were referred to as commanderies. And we'll see here the example of Slebeh Commandery in South Wales, Great Britain. Some pretty pictures. In themselves, these were quasi-islands, benefiting from a range of papal concessions that exempted them from local secular and religious jurisdiction and taxation. With the Protestant Reformation, the order lost many of these lands in places like the British Isles and much of the Holy Roman Empire. Nevertheless, in certain circumstances and through careful negotiation, the Order of St. John managed to retain many of its Catholic estates as Catholic islands in Protestant territories. These quasi-island territories were critical to the financial operations of the order, as resources from them flowed to the headquarters on the island of Malta, creating a very peculiar center-periphery relationship. Now, why do I describe it as peculiar? Well, because while Malta was the mainland to which resources from these quasi-islands flowed, it was itself a small peripheral unit, dependent on a larger mainland. When the order was on roads, it had a vital economic link to Cyprus. A parallel link existed between Malta and Sicily. If according to Brodel, the provisioning of cereals from beyond a 20 to 30 kilometer radius was hazardous, Malta's importation of cereals from Sicily, 60 kilometers away, was indeed risky. Famine was not an unfamiliar threat to early modern Malta, though its frequency tended to decrease over time. The dependence of Malta on Sicily was not limited to food supplies and other provisioning. Sicily was also uh, an important communication interconnector with the rest of Europe, as letters and news often passed through Sicilian outposts on their way to and from Malta. In this equation, Malta's existence became ever more Sicily-centric. And yet, it was the order that brought Malta into its communication networks, not the other way around. By its very nature as an international organization with many dependencies, the order had to have sophisticated communication networks. And these operated irrespective of, though not in isolation from, the place where the order's headquarters happened to be. It was not the island of Malta per se that participated in wider developments, but the headquarters of the Order of St. John that did so, that is the island order state. It's a subtle but important difference. As a result of various economic activities encouraged by the order on Malta, a process of de-Sicilianization unfolded. That is, there was a sustained effort by the order to cut the umbilical cord that linked Malta to Sicily. It was never fully accomplished, but the economic base was diversified. The order managed to create an environment where economic activity flourished, changing what had been an agrarian economy to a maritime one. Now, a particular sector there was corsairing. Corsairing was perceived as another form of economic enterprise. Corsairs were fighters and businessmen. On roads, the order had encouraged corsairing and had regulated and taxed it. On Malta, that pattern was continued. Corsairing existed before 1530, but with the knights coming over, it flourished. In 1605, the Tribunale dei Armamenti regulated regulating corsairing was established, through which the Grand Master ensured a 10% cut. Towards the end of the 17th century, the order established an institution with an even wider maritime economic remit, the Consolato del Mare, with jurisdiction over all commercial enterprises at sea. The judicial apparatus is a necessary element in the effective running of any state. Hence, the island order states continued development of such structures. 
Due to the steady increase in the number of vessels coming to Malta, there was also a constant stream of slaves flowing through the island. Indeed, Livorno and Malta have been compared to Algiers in the scale of human trafficking that flowed through them. The establishment of a prize market for slaves also served to attract merchants from many parts of the Mediterranean. The reciprocal benefits which were generated through the transfer and redemption of slaves saw Muslim ships being allowed to import and export merchandise from the island, thus ensuring a good return for ships. While the Hospitallers excelled in naval warfare, they also expended considerable resources in the defense of their island. They were, for instance, among the earliest users of bastions and gunpowder technologies. In a sense, the Hospitaller islands of the Aegean served as places where experiments in military architecture could take place. An interesting paradox to emerge in studies about military architecture on roads is how the Hospitallers developed one of the first bastion fortifications on the island of Leros and the Red Circle, but then opted for more conservative models on roads itself. Similarly on Malta, the order expended considerable resources on its land defences, regularly employing the best military engineers from across Italy and then increasingly France. A telling example can be drawn from the last years of the order in Malta, when in 1792 it was decided to construct a new fort. This fort, which became called Fortinier, represented a novel kind of architectural typology, as yet unseen on Malta, and really one of its first kind anywhere. Islands could lend itself, themselves as experimental places, Organic laboratories where innovation reflecting wider patterns of thought could be tested and improved. Admittedly, any place could be adequate as a site for experimentation. And yet, because of their clear-cut boundaries and limited territories, islands, it seems, were particularly subject to intensive processes of cultural encounter, making them revealing places to observe a variety of processes. It certainly seems to have been the case for Malta. Defending the harbour was essential. Indeed, the harbour dimension of the island order state was arguably its most important facet. This has led to the teasing out of the notion of island ports from the wider concept of island order states. The towering importance of the harbour on an island was captured in the iconography representing Malta particularly from the mid-17th century onwards, landscape paintings of Malta become dominated by Valletta and its harbour, as evident in this very representative example. The image presented in this 18th century bird's eye view of Malta's harbour captures a dynamic continuum between landscape, seascape and manscape to create an indivisible whole, where the harbour incorporates the whole island unmistakably indicating its political, economic, and cultural importance. Paintings such as this one present a land and seascape of triumph, a space shaped by the order and the Maltese, but which in turn also shaped them. I have already discussed the economic and military activities that centered around the harbor, but this was also a politicized space where the rituals that sustained the island order state unfolded. One particularly splendid, but not unusual, ritual occurred on the 1st of April 1705 on the occasion of the launch of the Order's brand new squadron of ships of the line, in Italian Vascelli. In the documents of the Order, it was described as the possess of the Vascelli by the Grand Master, echoing land-based occasions when princes symbolically took possession of cities in their realm. The brilliance of that day was captured in a large painted lunette in the palace of the Grand Master in Valletta, as well as in various portable watercolors such as this one, which today can be found in many collections across the world, fulfilling still their purpose of spreading beyond Malta the splendor of that occasion. 
This ritual occurred in the area just outside the harbour, that liminal space marking the entry-exit point to the island order state, and hence indicating the Grand Master's desire for the Vascelli to project his authority well beyond Malta. To conclude, I would like to go back to the explanation by the Soldanis of the term island in 18th century Maltese. Xira, isola, scoglio dal mare circondato, a small rock surrounded by the sea. True, and yet there was so much more to it than that. If we go back to Fra Petro Queiran, with, with whose story we began, he touched upon key elements uh, in this presentation. Land and sea, Christian-Muslim encounters, Malta as the island home of the order. Isolation and connectivity, in conjunction with insulation and smallness, created a particular dynamic. In a sense, isolation breeds innovation, a way of doing things and dealing with the world that reflected the particularity of an institution with a small sedentary headquarters, but a mobile organization. It has long been observed, and there is no denying, that the inception of the hospitaller presence on Malta initiated a long transition that deeply transformed the character of the island and its people. Medieval Malta had been a kivitas, one of many, in the kingdom of Sicily. The advent of the hospitallers in 1530 dramatically altered the status, so that by 1798, Malta was an independent sovereign state where people had ample opportunity of transcending the restraints of insular limits. It almost seems as if Brodel may have been thinking about Malta when he wrote that an accidental change of ruler or of fortune may bring to an island's shores an entirely different civilization and way of life, thereby transforming that island's character. The Order of St. John, an international military religious organization, and Malta, a small group of islands, both with their own dynamics, came together in 1530 and managed, over the course of time, to find a modus vivendi, creating spaces which were both shared and exclusive. Thank you. <laughs>